To the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love Mysterious Old Time Radio Stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today is the second in a four-part series featuring special requests and guest appearances by our mysterious patrons. Our patron of the week is Tim. Not boring old Tim who you hear all the time, but exciting new Tim who gives us money. We'll call him Awesome Tim for short. Awesome Tim requested we listen to Four Went Home from Escape. Escape premiered on CBS Radio July 7th, 1947 and ran through September 25th, 1954. Much like its sibling series Suspense, the name of the series told listeners what to expect. While Suspense focused primarily on edge-of-your-seat thrillers, Escape told stories of adventure set in strange and exotic lands. In order to make the program's life-and-death situations in faraway locales more vital and tangible, Escape grounded its stories in realism. With a few notable exceptions, the dialogue is naturalistic and the emotions are relatable, even when the productions revolve around extraordinary threats like abominable snowmen or killer ants. In 1947, Radio Life magazine praised Escape for this quality, declaring, These stories all possess many times the reality that most radio writing conveys. Four Went Home was written and directed by Anthony Ellis, who also wrote two of this podcast's favorite episodes of Escape, A Study in Wax and I Saw Myself Running. The production features another Escape regular, William Conrad, along with a cast of veteran radio actors, including John Daner, Peter Leeds, Bob Sweeney, and Jack Crucian. And now, let's listen to Four Went Home from Escape, first broadcast December 14, 1952. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker, listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are lying in a wartime prison camp. Surrounded by a desperate and brutal enemy. While your own forces are slowly approaching to save you, your frightened captors plan to kill you. Listen now as Escape brings you Anthony Ellis' exciting story, Four Went Home. Bad poker to be honest. Come on, come on. Dutch? One. Wouldn't you know it's drawn to an inside straight. He'll never learn. <laughs> be good, baby. Be good. Sap. Be good. Oh, I'm happy. I'll play these. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of bull. Listen to him. Play these. <laughs> bull. How about you, Curcio? Me? I'm honest. Three. <laughs> honest, oh, oh, great. No, I'm honest. And the dealer takes uh, a one? Hmm. Uh-huh. Okay, who bets? Uh, first bet. Of uh, course you. Yeah, okay, okay, I'm thinking. I check. There were five of us reading around the floor clockwise. Jerry Mitchell, infantry. He was the kid. 
The Nazis got him at the bulge. He'd seen a lot of war, and he was sick because of it. He was a good kid. Mitch? I'll sit and uh, raise a hat. Oh, wait a minute. Next to him, Armstead. Henry Dutch Armstead. Infantry. He'd been in the bulge, too, along with Mitch. He was from Pennsylvania. He used to play football. In fact, he made a career of it for seven years. Went from school to school, south and west. Called himself a football bum. His pal was Mitch. Dutch was okay. A big guy. Dutch? I'll call. And then Sandy Saperstein. Dark, wiry sap. Machine gunner. He taught math in a small upstate New York school and turned in his uniform somewhere in Belgium. A quiet man. Sap? Call and raise 50. Raise 50? And then there was Curcio. Andy Curcio, kid from Danbury. Look at your car. He had a job in a hat factory waiting for him when he got home. Curcio had been blown out of his tank, which is lucky for him. The other guys didn't do so well. And Curcio never forgot it. He was still fighting the war, even a prison camp. Curcio? Ah, bull. I'm out. What have you got, Dutch? Bullets and dolls. Three deuces, three. That uh, beats me. I have a small straight. Oh. Straight to what, Sap? To the eight. Ah, it's tough. Mine goes to the ten. Oh, oh bull. Ever see fine. anything like that? <laughs> Write it down, will you, Sap? Oh, yes, I got it. <clears throat> three eighty-five for Sergeant Nestor. Sergeant Nestor. <laughs> Give him a good shuffle, huh? Oh, sure, sure. Anything for you. Put shuffle. him away, fellas. There goes the lights. Oh, oh, always a light. oh well, another day, another dollar. Got a raise, eh, Sap? Oh, <laughs> funny, ah, funny. Oh, oh, you oh, you oh, write oh, your oh, material, Dad. <laughs> Saturday night. Saturday poker game with the guys. We knew it was Saturday because we kept score of the days on the calendar. You didn't count days, you kept score with them. And the game was to see who was going to win. You were the days. I guess as prison camps go, it wasn't bad. It wasn't good. It was nothing. The Nazis didn't talk to us much and we didn't talk to them. All except Curcio. We had to watch him because he loved to shoot off his mouth. The next hour or so, I lay in my bunk thinking... thinking about Junie and home. I figured most of the others were asleep until a pair of legs swung down from the bunk above and dropped to the floor next to me. It was Sapper Steve. You sleep, Sarge? Mm Mm-mm. Hey, listen, I got an idea. And again? No, I think this one will work. Oh, knock it off, Sappy. Get some sleep. Oh, wait a minute. Look. What's that? I found it last week. A piece of coat hanger. Yeah, but it's all twisted. I know. I did it. I think I can open the door with it. Unlock the door with that? Uh Uh-huh. I tried it. When? Last night when you were all asleep. I didn't have time to get it open because I heard the guard coming, but I think it'll work. Here, let me see that. Here. You see, the lock's old-fashioned. Mitch? Yeah. One of those dreams again, I guess. The kid doesn't look too good. Yeah, I know. Come on. What are you going to do? See if we can work the door. How long ago did the guard pass you here? About ten minutes. That gives us five more then before he comes back. Hey, what do you think, Sarge? We can make a break? Well, let's wait and see if we can open it. Okay, go ahead. It's got the catch somewhere on the bottom. I felt it last night. You haven't told the other guys, have you? No, no sense getting them all excited. Yeah. Come on. It was cold standing at the door. We were always cold in the camp. But that night, I noticed it more. Saperstein worked away with this bit of wire, his tongue sticking out between his teeth in concentration. About four minutes must have passed when... I got it. All right, try the knob. Close it, quick. 
guard's coming. Can you lock it again? I think so. He might have heard Mitch. Sergeant can't get it to catch. Now, cut it out. He'll hear. Stop it. I can. It took another ten minutes to lock it, and both of us were sweating before it was done. Sap and I agreed that I should talk to the guys in the morning after inspection and see if we could work out a plan. I figured the best way would be at exercise. Mitch was cleaning up the room, and Sap was playing handball with fellas from another unit, so there was just Armstead and Curcio and me. It was too cold to sit, so we walked up and down the enclosure. Oh, it's cold as witch's nose. Man, you're not just kidding. Look, I want to tell you guys something. Yeah, what is it, Sarge? Uh, Saperstein and me got the door open last night. Paul, you're kidding. You and Lucky. Keep door... it down, will you? Now, look. From what we hear, our guys are about 80 miles west. Maybe. Okay. Now, if they get closer... We gotta take a chance one way or the other. Oh, let's get out of here. That or try and figure what the Nazis will do to us if they think our guys are gonna spring us up. Yeah, I've been thinking about that plenty. There's more than a thousand of us in here. I've done it before. Gas, machine guns. Well, that's the chance. Then. What about the fence? You think we could get over? Might. Yeah, but it's electrified. Not over there, Curcio. Not by the gate. Oh, Paul, that's right under the tower. They'd see us before we got anywhere near the searchlight. That's what I mean. That's the chance. All right with me. Sure. I'll talk to the other guys later, though. Oh, uh, hey, hey, what about Mitch, though? I don't know. How do you think, Dutch? Well, he goes with. Sure he does. You think he can make it? He's in bad shape, Dutch. He might blow up. Oh, no, no, you leave that to me. The kid's okay. He's just a little nervous. He's okay. He can make it. Why don't we try it, Sarge? Tonight? Might as well tonight. Oh, boy, wouldn't that be something... Get my hands on a gun again. Oh, boy, I'll get me a couple of more Nazis before this war's over. Yes, well, you do that. Come on, we better get back with the others. Hey, you see over there? Huh? Bombers. Yeah. Give it to them, good boys. The Lancasters. No, they're ours. Uh, Lancasters. A buck. Okay, a buck. What do you say, Sarge? <laughs> You didn't learn much in aircraft recognition, did you? They're Lancasters. Oh, bull. We'd thought of breaking out before, but it never came to anything, mostly because it couldn't be done in daylight. There was no sense trying to dig, either, on account of the rock underneath. We'd found that out a long time back. But now, with a key, it was different. We didn't get a chance to talk together again until just before final inspection and lockup. Mitch was the big problem, and I put it up to him the way it was. That's great, fellas. Count me in. You think you're up to it, Mitch? Me? Sure. Of course. He's taking a big chance, kid. He'll be all right, I tell you. Now, wait a minute, Dutch. Let him decide for himself. Now, we want you to go, Mitch, but if you don't feel like you can make it, we can fix it so you won't get in any trouble if we leave you. How? How are you going to fix it? How we can knock him over the head, and then he can tell him that he tried to stop us. Hey, that'll work. That's swell. How about that, Mitch? What's the matter with you guys? I'm coming with you. I'm okay, honest. He's coming. Oh, watch out for him. He's coming, that's all. All right. All right, knock it off, inspection. Hi, you liver. Shut, Shut up, Curcio. <laughs> well, everything okay, yeah? Huh? So 
So help me, curse you. You pull something like that again, I'm going to bust you wide open. Ah, bully's just a stinking nut. That's I'm enough, curse you. Well, what do you say, fellas? It's Midnight? okay with me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, if we get out, we start heading west. Make as much time as we can before it gets light. Then hide out until tomorrow night. With luck, we ought to meet our guys along the way. Well, what happens if they pull back? Uh, maybe the guard who said they were 80 miles away was giving us the needle. Well, well, what about that? Well, listen, what about it? But maybe they want us to make a break so they can have an excuse to... Take it easy, kid. You see what I mean? We'll keep on walking until we find them. We'll find them, Mitch. Don't worry. Hey. Hey, fellas. How about poker? You know, celebration last night? What do you say? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's okay. Well, fine. Well, well. Break them out, Sap. Uh, I feel lucky tonight. We will return to Escape, and tonight's story, Four Went Home, in just a moment. Daily, the broadcasts of Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia strike through the Iron Curtain, bringing the truth about the free world to the captive peoples behind it. Help send a message by giving to the 1952 Crusade for Freedom. And now, back to Escape. We played poker badly. Every one of us looked at cards and thought of something else. I guess Mitch was the worst. He was really scared. And Mitch hadn't always been a scared guy. He talked a lot about what he was going to do when he joined up with our fellas. Talked about his girl and home and too many things. Because we knew he was scared, we let him go on talking. And then it was lights out. I made the guys lay down on their bunks. Nobody was going to sleep for sure, but a rest wasn't going to hurt. It was a little after nine. Uh, say, uh, say, say, Dutch? Uh? Uh, what was the score when you played Pan? When I played with who? Um, uh, Tech. Oh. Tech, the year you went to the ball. 34 to 6. We won. Yeah, that was right. 30, 34 to 6. 34. Yeah. Boy, what a slug. Got my beak busted in that one. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Mitch. The kid, you okay? Me? Sure. Yeah. Ready to go. That's a boy. Hey, what's the time, Sarge? Not even 9.30. Lots of time. Take it easy. Sure. I found myself singing a song under my breath, over and over, the way you sometimes do, you know. I knew it backwards. I remember seeing a movie with Junie at home and all the little things that happened that night. The movie, the coke afterwards. Everything except the name of the song. Hey, huh? what is it, Sarge? Well, uh, fellas, what's the name of this? Yeah, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. I can't have. Uh, you must remember this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this kiss is just a kiss. Yeah, kiss is just a kiss. Boy, it's more than that. Hey, I know. Time goes by. No, as time goes by. As time goes by. Yes, yes. time goes by. You remember Bergman? Boy. Yeah. You know, my wife, Junie's Swedish, and you know how the Swedes say Ingrid Bergman? Huh. No, how? <laughs> Ingrid Bergman. No kidding. Yeah. Ingrid Bergman. <laughs> you think we'll get out, Sarge? You think? We'll get out. Listen, uh, fellas... 
If anything happens... Uh, nothing. Nothing is going to happen, kid. Sure, I, I know. But, but if it does... Will you tell my folks? Nothing's going to happen, Mitch. Mitch, why don't you stick it out here? Huh, kid, you'd be okay and nobody... No, I'm... I'm fine. Maybe a little nervous, you know. Sure, sure. Guess maybe you guys think I'm chicken, huh? Oh, oh no, man. kid, you're no. okay. Just Listen, no. I got some poker money to collect from a couple of you, and I don't forget. <laughs> How am I going to forget? I'll be busted for ten years paying off what I lost in here. What's the time, Sarge? 10.30. 10 10.30. The guard passed our door every 15 minutes. I counted from 9 o'clock. And he was coming back for the sixth time. And he had passed six more times. And then we'd go. I thought about Mitch and the others. <laughs> Talk about the flip of a coin. This was it. You give a guy three stripes on his sleeve and he does the thinking for the rest. And if he thinks wrong, what about that? There was still time to call it off. And there was still time when it was a couple of minutes to 12. Stay in the camp and maybe the Nazis wouldn't get sore enough to knock us off because our fellas had released us. Yeah, maybe. How do you look at a man's face and know what he's got in his mind? A Nazi's face. A Nazi's mind. Okay. All set, huh? Now we'll wait until the guard passes at 12, and then, Sap, you get to the door and get it unlocked in a hurry. Yeah. Why not unlock it now, Sergeant? We could be good. No, no, we can't take a chance. I want it quiet. Real quiet. You understand? Yes, yes. Sir. Stay yes. in your bunks until I say. You ready, Sap? Yeah. Okay. 12 coming up. Now. Of all the nights, knock it out. He would. Okay, Sap, get going. Yeah. Come on, come on. How's it coming, Sap? Shut up, curse you. Sorry, Sarge. Take your time. Take it easy. It keeps bending when I put on too much pressure. It's okay. Just take your time. You'll get it. Yeah. You sure? Yeah. All right. We go now, Sarge? Now stay single file. When we get out of the building, get as close as you can to the wall. We'll have to time the searchlight as we go, Curcio. Yeah. You bring up the rear... Give the signal to drop when you see it. I'll do the same in front. Okay. What about the gate, Sarge? I told you. We make a run for it. Get over one by one each time the light passes. Now, let's go. Sap opened the door. We went out into the corridor. It was crazy. I kept thinking how crazy it was as we moved along to the entrance of the building. Curcio was last. Saperstein was in front of him. And then Armstead and Mitch and myself. I could hear the kid breathing behind me, quick, jumpy breaths like he was winded from running. And then we were outside in the enclosure. The light down! We flopped to the ground. And that bright watchdog looked right over us and beyond, cutting through the dark. Okay. You see us? They'll, they'll see us. Shut up, Mitch. You're going to be okay, kid. And we went another ten yards. Past another building. And down oh, again. As the searchlight made a return trip. 
We were about a hundred yards from the gate when we stopped and crowded into a narrow alleyway between the cookhouse and a shed. From there on, it was open country across the enclosure to the gate fence. And that was going to be tough. The guard's tower was almost directly in front of us. What's next, Sarge? Take off your boots. Tie them around your neck. The less noise, the better. It's a good idea. It's okay, Sarge. All right, I'll go first. And you, Mitch, Dutch, Sap, and Curcio. All right, with you. Yeah. But if no, bulls. Oh, no. Get your mouth shut, Mitch, or I'll punch your neck as far as you can. Come on. Don't shoot us. You know that you will. Grammy, will you grab me? Keep me quiet. Shut him up. Shut him up. Will you grab me? Dutch, keep him quiet. Quiet. gate's open. Boy, how I'd like to get through there. They must think we already got over. Hey. I don't get it. The searchlight stopped. They left the gate open. What the devil's going on? me. Can you see anybody up on the tower? Wait a minute. No. Nobody. What do you think, Sarge? I don't know. But maybe we won't have to go over the gate. The kid all right, Dutch? Dutch? Kid? Hey, what's with him? He passed out? He... He just suddenly didn't move anymore. The kid's dead. He just... went kind of limp. You big crazy... You choked him. You killed him. I did. I did. I didn't. I wanted him to keep quiet, that's all. Well, you saw that, Sarge, didn't you? I just tried to keep him quiet. Yeah. He's dead. Hey, what do you say, Sarge? We can't stay here, huh? Okay. I'm going across. If I get through, follow me one at a time. We walked across to the gate. It was dark. There wasn't a sound. There wasn't a Nazi around. Dutch came last, carrying the kid. I guess it wasn't more than ten minutes later along the road that we saw the first of our tanks. Patton's tanks. Then we knew why we'd been able to walk out of the gate. We kept moving back, and we didn't say anything. Not until we got to a medical outfit and left Mitch's body with him. And the four of us just kind of stood around waiting for somebody to take us back west. Gee, if we waited ten minutes. Yeah, just ten. He was a good kid. It wasn't your fault, Dutch. It could have happened to anyone. Sure, it breaks, I guess. It's not your fault, Dutch. <laughs> It's a, okay, Dutch. Well, come on, you guys. We can't find any cigarettes just standing here. We'll, we'll just be a couple of minutes. We'll meet you back here, Dutch. Yeah, Dutch, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Escape has brought you Four Went Home, written and directed by Anthony Ellis, starring William Conrad as the sergeant. 
Featured in the cast were John Daner as Olmstead, Peter Leeds as Curcio, Bob Sweeney as Mitch, and Jack Crucian as Saperstein. Editorial supervision is by John Meston, and the special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are crawling across a jungle savanna, your body flaming with fever, while behind you lies certain death, and ahead, the endless tortures of perpetual imprisonment. So listen next week when Escape brings you Evelyn Waugh's classic story, The Man Who Liked Dickens. Tomorrow night, Lux Radio Theater adapts an Academy Award winner, The African Queen, bringing you Humphrey Bogart in his original role, co-starring Greer Garson. Also tomorrow on most of these same CBS radio stations, listen for Lloyd Nolan in a story titled The Man with Two Heads on Suspense. Roy Rowan speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Four Went Home from Escape here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And that was a listener request and came to us from Awesome Tim. Not Boring Tim. (laughs) Awesome Tim! (laughs) I'm also enthusiastic about Awesome Tim. (laughs) (laughs) I was was at self-esteem therapy company. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) So what does Awesome Tim have to say? Yeah, well, uh, Tim could not join us uh, for his guest appearance here as a patron, so uh, I asked him to maybe share uh, a few thoughts about uh, why he chose this episode and why he supports the podcast, and he sent me back this email. Tim says, I had wanted to give my deep insight, words of wisdom to share with your admiring throngs, but I have come up short. I am very pleased that you are entertaining Four Went Home, and I'm sure your dissection of it will be not only intelligent, but witty as well. No pressure, guys. (laughs) (laughs) And that for me is the reason I listen to and support the morals. I will only say that the intimacy I feel listening to, one, a beautifully and carefully crafted gem such as Four Went Home, and two, the -the off-the-cuff banter you and Eric and Tim provide bring me nothing but pleasure and comfort. Thank you for gifting your own donation to the history of radio. I truly believe that someday in the future, three new jovial chums will be listening to the golden age of morals and discussing whether or not each of your episodes is a classic. For my part, the answer is... They all are. Oh, awesome, Tim. <laughs> That's a freaky thought. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't have put that in my head. I mean, I will be one of those three. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just going to be our heads in jars, continuing this <laughs> forever. What if there are people listening to this 100 years from now and going, listen to this, and then doing a podcast or whatever it's they called. They just didn't then. know any better, they will say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hate the internet, that whole forever thing. <laughs> all right. If you guys uh, could just talk for a while, I have to write down something funny and intelligent. For our throngs? (laughs) Apparently, that's on the docket. Hello, throngs! (laughs) That's an episode of Star Trek. (laughs) When they were attacked by the throngs... I think Admiral Throng is a uh, Star Wars villain. (laughs) It's a trap. No, it's not that one. You you can never get it right. That's Nixon. We've established that. (laughs) (laughs) It's a quagmire. Well, uh, let me start by saying to Tim, awesome Tim, I can't thank you enough 
that I don't have one bad thing to say about this whole episode. And I was really excited to talk about it because when it was done, I just sat there with my mouth open and went, wow, that was really, really cool. Um, and we've talked about this for, uh, before. My, my love of scenes of tension and um there's a lot in here it's every scene uh, yeah there's a lot <laughs> and it's it's just beautiful and i thought when you sent this to me i didn't know it was a listener request i really thought that this was sent to me as a gift from joshua oh <laughs> because be like, yeah, i know who's gonna love this but uh, it's awesome, a gift from awesome tim <laughs> awesome tim knows me better likes me better <laughs> And he's now my best Fine, friend. Fine, he's awesome Josh, too. Let's just <laughs> rip that Band-Aid off. <laughs> he's awesome Jim Tosh. Jim, Tim Josh. Nope, that doesn't work. <laughs> Intelligent and witty banter, folks. <laughs> Have you heard this before, Joshua? The first time I heard it was about, I think, two years ago when Tim first sent this out. Ah. Uh, and... I've been meaning to include it, but uh, Tim has also sent us some great recommendations in the form of Battle of the Magicians from Lights Out, which was right. so fun oh. to discuss, and the uh, Dragnet episode that it I'm is awesome, to- totally forgetting the name of. Uh, where it was they- the big something. Yeah. <laughs> or was it the werewolf or the... No, it was the one where they realized that they can't just stomp all over uh, oh. the suspect's rights. The big, the right. big ruling. The big ruling, yes. <laughs> I brought the werewolf one. Yeah. I went into this, uh, as I go into every episode of Escape now, wondering, will this be the one? Will this be the episode of Escape I don't like? And not only was this not the one, but I thoroughly enjoyed it in a way that was different than the way I've enjoyed other episodes of Escape. Which is not to say it's it's totally radically different, but that opening poker game, the texture of it is so real, it also really gives you the characters on a platter, even if you don't really recognize what all they're telling you, they are telling you who these characters are. And that simple formula of the title says four are going to go home. There's five somewhere in the next half hour. One of these guys ain't going to make it home. And you can take a wild guess and we were right, but so what? Yeah. And that is my only criticism of this entire episode is the title. I wish they had yeah. hid that. Yep. I, agree. I liked it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it worked for me. i normally would rather have less information and, and, Especially from the title, but this time the title really helped lay out the stakes for me. You like the Brechtian approach. Where's Eric? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> the reveal of the ending and then applaud through just waiting to find out what happens. It's maybe it also played specifically to me to my like, I, can, I know what's going on. I'll figure this out. I'll get it. And then the all the little details that fell into place for the, that last five or ten minutes. I could talk for 20 minutes about that poker scene. The, the realism, uh, the performance, uh, if it was written, wow. I'm convinced it wasn't. <laughs> I'm convinced they were talking. And then bravo to the director and the producer to allow that and to allow that, that, that ad lib improvisational aspect to it, to give it that realism. But man, it is like sitting at a table at a poker game and I was sitting right there because of the dialogue, because of the performance of that. It was just phenomenal. And don't get me wrong, I like the stilted old time radio hardcore dialogue, but this was so engaging. It was literally like sitting there. It is not easy for actors to capture that tone no. off of scripted material because it sounds so natural. We're acting in, you know, in a very conversational pace. At the same time, the things they're saying, the way they're making their bets, the way they're playing, it all really is grounded in their characters. It really is um, true to what they are. Yeah. If anybody out there wants to know how hard it is as an actor to not act like you're acting, just watch any actor doing a uh, commercial testimonial like they're an actual customer but it's an actor <laughs> i really love crisco i use it all the time it never comes out naturally it's really hard to do and to a writing point of view to reverse engineer a conversation yes it sounds dumb but it's hard it's really hard that's why i'm saying i don't think it was written i think they let him go because if it was written wow yeah and the other uh, example of that in this episode is when he's trying to remember the name of the song as time goes by and then they actually this really crazy moment and I don't know how to explain why it just floored me but when they said oh it's time goes by 
And then, no, it's as time goes. Oh, yeah, that's right. As time goes by. It's just that quick little. I was like, Why? has someone put a microphone in an actual POW camp? <laughs> <laughs> it was just gorgeous uh, and so real, which leads to the tension and the suspense. You're so there that it's terrifying to be clicking that door open. <laughs> Yeah, I could go on and on about almost every scene in this. It mm-hmm. Every scene seems just perfectly crafted, not just as a piece of writing, but specifically as a piece of audio drama. The scene where they're all in their bunks just killing that time. Yes. <laughs> because they have to wait till the guard has passed so many times. And like you guys said, the conversation seems just so real. And it seems strangely cozy and comforting because you can just imagine yourself in a less stressful situation as you're falling asleep having conversations with friends or family in a a strangely intimate moment yet at the same time you're totally aware they're getting ready to possibly die yeah and it's just those two feelings together just create this discomfort that is so amazing and there's something yeah almost like tears you up about Mm -hmm. them trying to remember the lyrics to as time goes by because that is what they're clinging to or to get them through or what the score of that one game was yeah the the reliving memories and Mm -hmm. and i will say that you said that they might die as i listen to this i'm convinced that the intent and the way it was done is they all know they are all going to die that is how it comes across but as they state it's that or they're going to kill us when yeah, they can, show up to uh, free us. So let's we go. We can die now, right. or we can wait to be killed. It's interesting, though, that they let you into the Sarge's thoughts at the very last second. And I can't remember where in the scene lineup it happens, but it's that line about you give a guy three stripes on his sleeve and he does the thinking for the rest. Right. And lets you in on this impossible choice he has to make. And so we go into it, like you said, thinking this is the right choice. And Ellis, by giving us this one last think through by Sarge, reminds us that we agree with him. Yes. He's making the right choice. So <laughs> right. that when it, that gut punch at the end, that turns out he made the wrong one, at least for Mitch. Mitch right. would still be alive had he gone the other way. Right. And to me, I think it really underscores that message which opens a whole nother interesting can of worms. This is about seven years after the war ended Mm -hmm. that we're starting to be able to depict the war as a just war, but still a bad war. Mm -hmm. This is a bleak story that says these guys had no good choice. Right. It it wasn't uh, a sugar-coated bravery and dying with your boots on and no blood, where they weren't afraid to say, you know, patriotism and did my duty. Yeah, great. But it, it sucked. (laughs) <laughs> and we're not saying that out loud. And that was just starting. And and there's a great example of that, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but the guy uh, crying in his sleep and, and having yeah. nightmares. Oh, and to be replaced by the, the next guy who's now crying in his sleep. Yes, exactly. That speech, that Sarge's speech, is the only thing in here that, to me, is at all close to a flaw. And it really isn't. It's a really finely crafted piece of writing. It serves a really great purpose in the story. But after all that supernatural dialogue, it sounds just a little constructed. It sounds a little artificial. It's narration, though. Yeah. And so I think it gets away with being artificial. I don't say it's it did this wrong, but just in structuring this together and getting that intimate little insight into his thoughts and all the advantages you get that you said, after hearing so much of really natural dialogue... It takes you just a little bit out of it Mm. to hear narration. I would only say that at all because there's nothing else to critique. Let me throw this out there. Because when it happened, I was like, "Ah, I wonder if that's a flaw in Tim and Joshua's, how they thought of this. Mm. When the sirens go off, that's about a minute and a half of absolute chaos that's really hard to follow. Did it bug you? I loved it. I can tell you why I loved it. It has to do with another thing I absolutely love about the construction of this is that this is a prison camp where we never hear a single German voice, a single right. Nazi, until 
yep. that moment. So then the first time you hear the Nazi soldiers yelling and screaming in the background, I think that's just really effective. Mm-hmm. And it matches the rest in that you can't make out what they're saying. Right. You're hearing them, but they never speak any sort of coherent dialogue. They mm-hmm. are just this force that exists in the camp that does not speak intelligently. Um, and then I also found it really appealing from a sound design that it takes you a moment to realize some of that noise is actually Mitch. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, yeah. And the disorienting yeah. quality of that, I think, puts you in the place of those guys escaping. There's all these noise. You don't know what is what. Is it Mitch? Mm-hmm. Someone's starting a car. Are they getting in a car? And so I was just right there in the chaos in a way that I really enjoyed. Yeah, it, it takes, what, 10, 15 seconds before you realize, oh, Mitch is freaking out yeah but he is the whole time it, it reminds me of a couple of different songs out there where the lead singer love and rockets has a song prince has a song there's a couple of the, the you realize oh that's not a guitar that's their voice as it <laughs> morphs into the guitar solo or coming out of it the other thing that i agree 100 percent with what josh was said was this was the point in the plan of they had 24 hours basically to put the plan together and the plan was run unlock the door <laughs> crawl across and then figure something out and this was the point at which it was figure something out so mm-hmm. again because i i listen to these things in a very sort of i want to try to get ahead of the plot compulsively somehow that this was the point of like I, I don't know what's happening now right and they don't either yeah but that's an incredibly dangerous maneuver Production-wise, uh, performance-wise. Escape-wise. <laughs> right. <laughs> but for the listener to throw them into that chaos without any direction and just the noise of things, how it actually was sounding to them, is dangerous. Like, you could lose people. And it was so effective. I was running around in a circle screaming, <laughs> trying to find something to put over Mitch's mouth. You know, like, oh, my God. And and then the realization, they're running out the gate. Maybe they thought we went over the fence. It's when you start to go, oh. Yeah. And that's the other thing. I guessed what happened before they told us, and I didn't care. Oh, they're running from the Allies. Yeah, when when they weren't all shot and killed, so something else was going on. Right, right. And that all that chaos also really pays off when, with the reveal of what happened to Mitch. Of mm-hmm. You get why that happened. Why um, Dutch? Dutch, yes, thank you. Mm-hmm. Went too far. And the description, we know he's gigantic and strong. And, it was carefully laid out, but not yeah. hitting you over the head with it. No. Just you thought, oh, this is the way they're delineating the five of these men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And that those two were the ones who knew each other and they were friends. Yeah, and that makes it even it, so much more painful. There's also something really nice about the way there is no real focus put on the actual accidental death of Mitch. Yeah. Again, it puts you in the place you're escaping. You're not paying attention to what's going on and you find out about it later. Right. You don't know what's going on. So you really understand that he did this inadvertently. In the same chaos you're trying to. And uh, your life's at stake. And if you want to live, you got to keep this guy quiet. And to be able to convey all that, as Eric said, in a audio <laughs> form, in a dramatic way that keeps you from being able to readily interpret everything in the moment, but yet once you figure it all out, it's still satisfying and not frustrating as a listener, is Just really a miraculous... Miraculous. <laughs> it, it, the the bits and pieces that you're given. And that's the other thing about Dutch. What he's doing to Mitch is out of love. Yeah. He's trying to save him by yeah. keeping him quiet. And, and Dutch ends up being the real tragic figure here. Of mice and men. <laughs> well, he, he's the guy who picks up Mitch's shell shock. Well, yes, there's that. He's, yeah, as Tim said, he's going to be the guy in the bed crying now. Mm-hmm. But he was wrong, too. The other guys kept trying to talk Mitch into staying. And mm-hmm. it was Dutch yeah. the whole time. Sticking up for him. He yep. can do it. He can make it. Even earlier on, I was wondering, before any of this happened, like, who's being cruel and who's being kind here in the different world where they said all right we're gonna leave mitch we're gonna beat him up pretty good so it looks good then they walk out the door <laughs> which and then turn right mean. around again like oh the uh, allies are here uh sorry for beating you up <laughs> <laughs> uh let's quickly just hit on there's nothing really to discuss other than the agreement of the brilliance of it when he is woken up and he's showing him the wire hanger key he's made. Mm -hmm. And in the background, you're not sure what you're hearing. Why is there this low moaning, screaming 
of someone in the background. You, you don't know. And they don't acknowledge it. I don't know. It's, no, that's it's the thing is, I, I felt I knew pretty quickly, like, that's Mitch. He's having a rough night. And the fact that they didn't acknowledge it. The fact that they didn't acknowledge it. What well, tells you that it happens every night. Correct. Yeah. And it's beautiful writing. Like, mm-hmm. they're used to it. And you would be tempted as a writer to tell your audience what that is because you would be worried that they'd be like, what is that? And distracted from the story. Do you see what I'm saying? You yes. would, but the reality is they wouldn't acknowledge it, but you'd be tempted as a writer to have them tell the audience what that was. And so what happens is it becomes this ghostly, horrific daily thing for these men. And again, just dangerous is the word all I can come up with writing wise, but a, a risk, it's a risk. Uh, mm-hmm. to throw that in there and not acknowledge it because what do we do? What is that? What is that? Is that Mitch? What's going on? And it turns out it's so done so well that we also hear about the hangar key. We're not distracted to yeah. the point of mm-hmm. we missed the plot point. And the sound in that scene, mm-hmm. uh, I, I was talking earlier about how every scene seems to be designed around some audio moment. Mm-hmm. And A, just having them speak in such hushed tones mm-hmm. just makes it dynamic and something interesting and different from the previous scene you do have mitch crying in the background you're in a prison so you know they have to be really quiet so just the sound of the knob turning and him opening Mm -hmm. it just as mitch cries out really loud in his (laughs) sleep then they have to close it and then just the sound of the footsteps of the guard coming closer and then walking past and it says everything you need we've said it before Escape did it again. They're fully, nobody comes close. Nobody's as good at, at fully in old time radio that we do on this podcast than Escape. Nobody. The intricacies and the subtleties and the effort they put in to create atmosphere of sound, they have no peer. It's an interesting contrast because I, I would almost argue Dragnet. But Dragnet does something oh, yeah. very, very, very different where they create this world out of really specific mundane noises. And Escape, it's all storytelling. And Escape yeah. does really well with textured, mm-hmm. layered sound uh, that creates a, I'm trying to think of a better word than busy because it sounds negative, but uh, textured is best. Textured sound. Perfect um, word for Whereas it. Dragnet, which is really appealing, has that real discreet clarity yeah, of th- sound. Don't get me wrong. Dragnet work really hard at their sound. I mean, it's amazing, but you're exactly right. Mundane things versus the Foley is part of the storytelling. Yeah. It's propelling yeah. you forward. There is a really great moment, again, that really tells you that this was written a bit after the war because you would not have heard this exchange in a wartime war story. I mean, you'd never hear this in a wartime war story, this whole play, but I think it was, maybe it was Curcio. Yeah, it was probably Curcio because he's the big Yeah, breaker, he's the guy who's right? not done fighting. Yeah, he is very excited about this escape idea and starts talking about getting his hands on a gun, gun and taking out some Nazis, which is a real typical kind of wartime propaganda thing. And then Sarge replies with a, yeah, swell, you do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I was trying to think, have right. I heard anything from old time radio that is sort of taking the you know wind out of the sails of a patriotic guy who wants to kill Nazis. Right. And I don't think that's what Sarge is objecting to, but he is objecting to bravado in the face of actual life and death right. yeah. danger. And right. I, I thought it was a great moment. Mm-hmm. You brought it up and you said you wanted to touch on it later. Uh, the Germans walking into the room. To inspect them to inspect before them. they go to bed. Without speaking any German is another beautiful piece of writing and performance. That is... Inglorious bastards mm-hmm. tension going on there, man. And by not speaking, they seem more dangerous. That's exactly right. And there is a dragnet level piece of tiny, tiny sound in that scene. I listened to it three times to make sure I wasn't imagining this, but maybe it's just so good that you see these visual pictures. But there is a tiny little sound of the heel turning sharply oh. as mm. the Nazi turns to leave in place of answering him. Because he says, everything okay, yeah? And there's a little bit of a shuffle of step, and to me, sounded just like a Nazi turning sharply on his heel and the steps going away. That uh, picks up, what would they call it, rhymes with, in the speech of, you can't read a face, especially a Nazi face, that these are shadowy silhouettes of people, not real people, that Mm -hmm. they can't be known, they can't be predicted. I think the most revealing thing about 
this episode was the solidification of Anthony Ellis's ability to write. Now it's to the point where with Anthony Ellis, I'm like, did he write novels? I might actually start reading books. Ooh. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Tim, what have you done to us? <laughs> <laughs> but now the, the trick is, can we find something written by Anthony Ellis that sucks? <laughs> I, I have to wonder if you're listening to this in 1952, there's no one listening to this that has not been touched by the war. Right. Because there aren't six-year-olds listening to this episode of Escape in 1952. So, well, in 52, was that had Korea started by that point? Either it had just started, just started or it's the next year. I can't remember. It's like 52, 53, somewhere in there. I'm pretty sure it was 52. If we only had a machine that could look up information <laughs> immediately. But my first take through this was that this had to be devastating to someone listening to it in in 1952 but on a second listen i think and you know i can't know this but i had to also imagine that there was something cathartic about it especially after having to put on a strong face and Mm -hmm. to do all the propaganda that you need to do to win a war to Mm -hmm. have someone tell a far more honest story Mm -hmm. this is a long way around but there was a a, at least a point in time when police officers were asked what is the most realistic police show you've ever seen and the top of the list was barney miller yep and so if you were i think someone who was a pow that this experience of just being closely connected to the people who were there with you was what your experience was well should we uh throw it to a vote uh yeah this is ridiculous uh i'll go i'll take it even farther than it not only classic and stands the test of time and all those wonderful things we said Another one that just broke into my top five of all time. This is up there with uh, on a country road and a kid in the back of the airplane is going to die with his dad. <laughs> See, that title too had way too many spoilers in it for me. <laughs> what was the name of that one? The long title. The, 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 <laughs> it was The Long Night. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it, this is top five. And one of the reasons that it's top five for me, just to be transparent, is it also checks the box for me of I love World War II stories. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, I really love Memorial Day. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a weekend of great movies. <laughs> Thanks, dead uh, veterans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, this was just fun. Uh, great thing to have introduced to my life, and I'm so glad I lived long enough to hear it. Uh, yeah, this is a classic, shocker, and is just a phenomenal thing to hold up as this is what audio drama can be. Right. And it is so much more than you would just think it could be. Mm-hmm. It really, really elevates the whole art form. Yeah, classic. This is whatever's higher than a classic. <laughs> Uh, Super classic. Awesome classic. Awesome yeah. Tim classic. Yeah. Sure. Intelligent and witty banter. <laughs> uh, Slow <yeah>. down. <laughs> the yeah. script, the sound effects, the performance. It's just everything about it is flawless. And I agree with everything you guys said. And just to underscore again for me, it really reminded me of All Quiet on the Western Front. Yeah. That sort of idea that these are everyday people who have been put in this awful situation and there are just no good options. And even in those situations, you know, an action taken with the best of intentions, uh, with bravery and determination, Mm -hmm. will still likely turn out in tragedy. (laughs) Yeah, when you mentioned... Which is such a bleak idea, but I, again, go back to the idea that I think that had to be cathartic for people Mm -hmm. who lived through it to hear. Yeah. That it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, if you made your best choice and got terrible results, you still made your best choice. Yeah, Yeah. when you said everyday people, at that point when they were telling us who they were, I was reminded of Saving Private Ryan and the idea that these people were coming from mundane, everyday jobs and now doing that. And I think this makes Saving Private Ryan look hokey, honestly. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I think this is more sophisticated, much better constructed writing. That's the, I, the thing I want to touch, go back around and touch on again was, as someone who scrutinizes writing and performances, that this production can really stymie me of, is this actors improvising who have right. really got their characters down? Or is this actors reciting 
scripted lines at a really high level performance. So either way, these are great performances. But. One more tiny thing I forgot to mention that I have to mention that I loved is that tiny moment where they see the planes flying overhead and they have that yeah. little moment where they just have a bet whether <laughs> those American planes or those Lancasters. And it really doesn't do much for the story. It might be interpreted as foreshadowing that they're really on the move and closer than yeah. they think the, mm-hmm. uh, the allies are. But really, it's just Ellis is smart enough to take one more little beat of authenticating detail to get the sense of these are guys that know each other and have these comfortable, familiar exchanges that these are all brothers and have spent this time together and it again just makes everything that's about to happen <laughs> all the more yeah. tragic and i think this is the biggest indication of a s- episode of old time radio that we love is that we vote on it and then keep talking more. <laughs> <laughs> well tim tell them stuff hey everybody Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. You'll find other episodes of this podcast there, or you'll find them wherever you get your podcasts normally. But at ghoulishdelights.com, you'll also be able to vote in polls. Let us know what you think. Leave comments on episodes. Send us messages. If you have episodes you want to request, send us a message. Uh, You could also link to our Threadless store and buy some swag. Ooh, swag. Or link to our Patreon page. Yes, you can go to patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast. Be like awesome Tim. Be like normal Tim. He supports the podcast in his own weird way. But I've been <laughs> upgraded to normal. <laughs> no. <laughs> but please go to patreon.com slash the morals and if you can support the podcast, you have heard uh, weeks and weeks of testimonials from our patrons, and we finally told them, stop, you're embarrassing us. So we have no testimonial for you other than our own desperate begging. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to see us perform live, the Mystery Sold Radio Listening Society Theater Company does recreations and adaptations of classic radio, drama, and also a lot of our own original work. We perform monthly. We're always somewhere. So, uh, unless this is 100 years from now and you're critiquing this and uh, <laughs> this is on the internet, that we're probably not performing live anymore. But if you go to MysteriousOldRadioListeningSociety.com or GhoulishDelights.com, There you will see where we're performing this month and what we're performing. And you can come see us. And if you can't come see us, you can buy a virtual ticket and watch it. And if you're not available that night, you can buy a ticket online and watch it later. No excuses. You have no excuses. Just send us some money and don't watch it ever. We don't really care. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Pay us off to go away. (laughs) Then you would be me. Uh, I just realized the other day, I've never actually watched one of our performances. I wonder... (laughs) Oh, we're quite good. Are we? (laughs) Yes. Okay. I should really... I forget that they're taped. Hey, what are we doing next? Next, we have another patron recommendation. Uh, This one is from Patricia. It is the House of Death from the Mysterious Traveler. Until then... Look out! We, uh, in my house, just did a Barney Miller marathon. (laughs) And I'm going to make this quick. Please trust me. It stands the test of time. It is so... It's really funny. So good. It's it a one-act sh- play every week. It's just it, amazing. And really well done. We watched the Pot Brownies episode again, and oh. I just I just can't take it. I can't take <laughs> it. Anyway, that's so off topic, but man, I would do a Barney Miller podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, this is the last episode. It's already listening to something. Well, we watched a, like a, a mashup of just Barney Miller, Columbo, maybe Taxi, I don't know. Rockford Files. Rockford Files. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Taxi. 70s goodness.